Hey folks, let's talk about the katana, samurai and half-sorting. So I've spoken pretty much uh, lots of times in the past, talked about half-sorting in European sources, and I have mentioned in passing that half-sorting can be done and was done with Japanese swords in well, right the way through the period, as far as we know, certainly, um, there's evidence that um, as long as katanas were used, occasionally something like half-sorting was used. Now, before I go on to talking specifically about the uh, katana, let's just talk a little bit briefly. Most of you probably know most of this, hopefully, by now, if you've seen my previous videos, about half-sorting. So, first of all, what is half-sorting for? Well, there are two main purposes to it, okay? One is for using a sword in extreme close range in order to support the weapon at two roughly equal points, okay, so that you've got an equal-ish amount of weapons sticking out of both ends, a little bit like a short staff, like a stick, essentially, okay? Um, and that's for many different reasons, but obviously at close range, this might be a better way to use any kind of weapon, be it an axe or a warhammer or a sword, than indeed uh, trying to keep holding it as you would conventionally think of a sword being held, either obviously in one hand or two hands. Um, simply because if you're at very, very close range, in other words, grappling range, it might be that your weapon is vastly more effective like this than it is like this, okay? So that's the very first thing to acknowledge. The second reason for half-sorting is something that actually gets talked about, I would say, more in uh, discussions, in forums and, and uh, literature, and indeed on YouTube videos when talking about half-sorting, and that is as an anti-armour strategy. Now, when we're talking about armour, in the age of the longsword, we're specifically really talking about full plate harness with mail, for the most part, in most of the gaps. Obviously, you can't put mail in all of the gaps, but the main major gaps um, on uh, full plate are the armpits, the insides of the elbows, the backs of the knees, the groin, um, and sometimes around the neck, okay? And those are usually covered by mail. There are, of course, some places, um, openings in between plates, essentially, which won't be full of mail. So sometimes, for example, there'll be um, a, an articulated spalder on the shoulder. And indeed, if you manage to get a point into one of those gaps, if there is even a gap that you can thrust into, good armor is often made so there isn't really an opening. But this is just a basic example. We could be talking about the knee or the elbow or some other part, but if you thrust them into a gap, sometimes there might not be mail there because very often in the 15th century anyway, um, they weren't wearing complete mail underneath the plate because that would be needlessly heavy. Instead, they were wearing what were called voiders. In other words, filling the gaps, filling the big gaps like the armpits and the backs of the knees and the groin. Um, and places where there wasn't a big gap wouldn't necessarily be filled with mail. So therefore, if you thrust into one of the really small gaps, then there won't be mail there. And hopefully, or in, if you're trying to defeat somebody who's trying to kill you, then hopefully you will stab them in that place. A typical example, if we just look at the uh, bassinet right behind me here, is the eye hole. Indeed, if you thrust the sword straight into an eye hole, as you see there, then it will go straight into someone's head. Now, um, in terms of the ability to do that, if I just grab that bassinet for a minute. So as you will see with this bassinet, there are essentially two main areas, shall we say, regions, where you can aim to offend the person. Remember, cutting does nothing against plate armor. Um, the person inside this helmet will hear a ding, and that's it. They will feel very, very little else. Yes, indeed, there are some overweight reenactment weapons, um, swords that are made to hit with the force of something like a mace or a hammer by being very heavy. Yes, the person will feel that a bit more, but it's not gonna kill them for the most part. They'll just feel a dong and it might move their head slightly. But in terms of killing the person quickly, we're really talking about thrusting and stabbing, okay? And the two regions against the helmet are um, either through the mail and padding of the neck defense, and bear in mind that you've got layers of what's essentially gambeson inside there protecting the neck, okay? Or through the eye slot. Now. To get into um, either of those locations, you have to be quite accurate, okay? And yeah, you can sometimes do those things by holding the sword conventionally and just thrusting really accurately and either getting through the, uh, the neck, through the avantail, as it's called, the mail going around the neck, 
or trying to get into an eye hole. But think about this for a second. If if you're determined, if you're if you're in armour and you can take cuts and thrusts and cover yourself coming in, and you're going to come in close and try and stab the person there, do you think it's easier to try and stab through someone's eye hole like this, wiggling it around? Or do you think it might be easier to stab through the eye hole doing this? Okay, it's going to be easier doing like this, isn't it? So there are two main reasons for supporting the blade with your spare hand. One is accuracy and control. Okay, that's number one. And the second is sometimes if you grip the blade, if you're trying to thrust through something really resistant, then essentially you're stiffening the blade because obviously if a force gets applied to this blade at the end, it will flex here. But if I'm holding the blade there, we're now only applying the bendy bit to that end of blade, which is gonna flex less, so you'll lose less energy. So essentially you can thrust with more power when it's half sword thrust as well. So those, to summarize, those are the two main reasons for half swording in any martial art, in any system, with any weapon. It's either for close in fighting and the fact that you can uh, maneuver the weapon around better and use it in close range more adeptly, okay? Or it's for armored fighting specifically to increase your accuracy and power of thrusts, okay? So those are the two main reasons. We could potentially add in extra things. There might be certain things you do with draw cuts and stuff like this, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but generally speaking, those are the two main reasons for half sorting in European sources. Now let's go back to the katana again. So with the katana, obviously predominantly it's used as, as, a, cutting, as a cutting weapon uh, with two hands on the hilt, sometimes with, with one hand on the hilt, sometimes with a wakazashi in the other hand. Okay, so it's predominantly used as a cut and thrust sword. But indeed, in Japanese martial arts, they do half sorting for exactly the same reasons as we find in the European treatises. This is confirmed through modern Kenjutsu practice. It's still surviving in modern Kenjutsu schools. Um, in, those, both, in both those contexts, it's found in Iaido practice, in Iaido forms as well. Um, both in situations where the blade is being used defensively in certain close-in situations, or indeed in very close scenarios, um, where you don't necessarily have the range or the distance to use the katana in a conventional way. It's actually the hand is brought up to enable the use of the point and the edge while you make space enough to get back out to use the sword conventionally again. So it's used in that way. But in addition, obviously, the samurai face some of the same problems as European men-at-arms or knights did when fighting in armour. The fact is that armour is an outstanding protection against someone just hitting it, okay? And if someone's wearing a kabuto or any kind of helmet, a European helmet, could be a sale, could be a bassinet, you can't cut through those generally speaking, okay? Yes, there might be some heroic art, there might be some texts which say, and he cut through a helmet and this kind of stuff. There may indeed have been blade tests where they hit um, ja Japanese helmets kabuto and they practiced um, hitting them to see what the damage to the blade would be and things like this. There may be exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, if you're faced with an opponent who's wearing a helmet, is it best idea to just go bong on the top of their helmet? No, <laughs> it's better to hit them somewhere where there isn't armor or bypass the armor. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is half sorting in Japanese martial arts, just as it is in European martial arts. So again, the two main ways of using this um, half sword, either unarmored situation as a close in thing, using it like a small close in slicing and dicing, like a mini pole arm. And it's very important to remember, of course, that this isn't a foreign or unusual technique. Essentially what you're doing is you're going, this is a sword, but I know how to use a pole arm, I know how to use a yari or a naganata or a European spear, partisan, pole axe, whatever. Um, and therefore I'm gonna apply those techniques to the use of my sword because this is the context, close in context or anything else, where it is appropriate to do that. So that's one. The other is as an anti-armor thing, you need to bypass the armor and yes, in Japanese armor, there are more openings than in medieval European armor. So for example, certain bits of the insides of the legs and stuff like this, sometimes you might be able to aim at a particular part and slice or thrust through a gap, okay? Which you don't necessarily get with say 15th century full plate harness in Europe. But if you 
If you're fighting armoured, at some point you're going to end up close to an armoured opponent and not only does this become useful as a lever and in the same techniques as you might use unarmoured, okay, remember you've got a pommel, you've got an edge and you've got a point and in close range, if you come really up close to the camera, dum dum dum, all of these techniques can be useful at protecting yourself and at getting in and, um, and working against the person and assisting grappling as well, essentially assisting your jiu-jitsu techniques or your ring and techniques in Europe. But in addition to that, you have a very functional point on a katana. And yes, indeed, a katana historically is not just a cutting weapon. People obsess over the cutting power of the katana, but it's a pretty good thruster as well. And there's a very good reason for that. It's a stiff blade. You can barely flex this blade. This is not a very good quality. This is a Chinese made um, replica, but it is sharp. I cut with it. It cuts well and it thrusts well. And these points, um, whilst they might not penetrate things like mail as effectively as a European longsword point does, because the European longsword point is more slender, um, they are nevertheless a very strong point. And Remember that with Japanese armour, the gaps might not be full of mail, they might just be full of, you know, silk and clothing and stuff. So, and you've got openings in the helmet um, and openings around the side and various openings you can thrust into. And if you can work your way in close to someone uh, within the context of the normal fight and then bam, get that point accurately into uh, someone's eye, for example, or their neck or the junction of their arm or something like this, you're going to do a huge amount of damage to them and half sorting absolutely was done in Japan and is still done in Kenjutsu practice today for that reason. Um, now one specific thing to talk about is gripping the blade. So a lot of people absolutely freak out when they go, oh you can't grip a sharp blade, blah blah blah. Well so many videos have pointed out that yes, this is a sharp blade I cut with regularly, you can grip it, okay? You're not gripping it with a huge amount of force, but you're gripping it enough that when your dominant hand is holding the handle tight, this hand can either support the flat to steer the point, or indeed can grip in order to do some wrestling and stuff. But it is absolutely true as well that narrower blades are easier to grab and hold than sharp wide blades. If I took something like that big Zweihander behind me, that's got a wide enough blade that it's not comfortable for me to grip around the blade. European longswords are narrow enough that I can grip around the blade fairly comfortably. What we do see when we look at Japanese techniques is all of the ones I've seen don't grip around the blade, <laughs> okay? They pretty much always either support with an open hand the back of the blade or sometimes they grip the flats of the blade okay so sometimes you'll see this like gripping the flats and again this is a sharp katana that I cut stuff with okay either gripping the flats or just supporting the back and that's enough for half sorting purposes you're not going to have a tug of war with this weapon the other person's not going to hold it and you're going to hold it and you're going to tug 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 all you're doing is your dominant hands on the handle and your secondary hand is helping to steer and support. Okay, really, really important. The final thing I want to say is this isn't peculiar to simply medieval Europe or medieval and Renaissance Europe and Japan. Um, it's also true of China and Korea. Um, if we look at Chinese and Korean um, treatises, then in fact we can indeed see techniques looking very much like the Japanese techniques where they support the sword momentarily or sometimes for a prolonged period um, with the blade. And they even show it in the same way, supporting the, uh, the, the back, the blunt edge like this. Um, and it, you know, for similar reasons, again, those two main categories we looked at, either supporting it um, because we're in very close range and it becomes better to use the weapon like this either for slicing, pushing or thrusting in close range and indeed pommeling or as a lever, as a grappling lever um, or potentially for armoured techniques. Now I don't know of evidence that they were doing this for armoured fighting in China and Korea but it wouldn't surprise me if they did. You know, similar problems lead to similar conclusions. Not always but similar. Not necessarily the same but similar. Um, but we can absolutely categorically state that in unarmoured fighting they did um, obviously use two-handed swords like the Japanese did, slightly different styles, but they used them in 
some similar ways and they did occasionally defend and they did occasionally stand in guard with the with the back edge supported in the middle of making actions um, just like we see in European sources and Japanese sources. So it was done in Asia, it was done in Europe, I'm sure it's been done everywhere in the world that used similar weapons and faced similar problems. Thanks for watching, I hope this has been interesting and I'll see you for the next video. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching, please subscribe, we have extra videos on Patreon and you can follow us on Facebook.